Hello, everybody. My guest today is Paul Powers. He's a Forbes 30 Under 30 award winner, successful serial entrepreneur in B2B technology development and SaaS companies. He's got a law degree from the University of Heidelberg in Germany and a member of the National Small Business Association's Leadership Council, now working on a company called Fizna in the CAD search engine space. Paul, are you ready? Are you ready to the top? All right. Thank you. You bet. All right. What is a CAD search engine? What's that mean? So FISNA is best thought of as like an autofill for 3D design. So if you're in the process of designing something, FISNA will try to guess what you're designing and search throughout your database, um, be it through CAD or PLM or whatever you use to see if you've designed something similar to that in the past so that you don't design things from scratch. Interesting. This is kind of like when people use Gmail and Gmail auto completes your emails when you're typing kind of the same thing. Absolutely. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. uh, Walk me through the business model. How do you make money? Sure. So we're a, a SaaS platform. So the way that we work is that um, you know, we work with engineers and manufacturers. They pay us an annual subscription uh, fee to use the software. Typically, FISNA is either used as an integration into whatever CAD software, or PLM software they're using, but you can also use it as standalone. Uh, and we keep it real simple. We don't care if it's used on the cloud or if it's an on-prem server that they're using. It's always the same fee, always the same arrangement. So they pay a one-time fee uh, or you know, an annual fee per user per year. Okay, and and help me get a sense on average, what's the company gonna pay you per year to get access to this? It really depends on how many people they have. So to put it into perspective, um, we did some uh, some studies on what what we were saving the average customer. We saved the average customer um, thirty seven thousand four hundred and forty dollars per user per year that they're with us. Um, but the average cost per user is going to be 2,500. So it's a 15 to one ratio of savings to cost. So okay. And, and how, I guess what I'm, what I'm really asking is when an org signs up, typically how many seats are they signing up with? Are these, is this for teams of three or 300? Oh, it, it's, it's all over the place. So we have people signing up for, you know, a couple licenses. There are companies that have 30,000 uh, engineers and there are uh, lots of them that we're seeing that have maybe anywhere between 50 and 500. I would say it seems to be the average number, but you know, it really does scale. Okay. You said 50 to 500 might be a good average. I would say that's probably the average size that we talked to. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Good. So I want to make sure I got this right. So, so if you have a team of, if I'm, if I'm running a team of 50 right now, right, let's say it's an architecture firm and I sign up for you, it's going to be 2,500 bucks per user per year. Correct. Okay. So about 125 grand for the year. Right. Okay. Very good. But if you look at how much you'd save, <laughs> you'll be saving. Uh, no, no, by the way, credible. I'm yeah. not shocked by that number. I get, I get, I, I listen, I was architect major in, in college, so I get it. I mean, there were so many times where I was copying and pasting like groups of lines and symbols. <laughs> I mean, I totally get what you're building. It makes perfect sense to me. Um, oh, no, put this on a timeline for me. When'd you launch the company? What year? 2015. 2015. And I mean, where were you? Were you an engine on the engineering side or the architecture side? How'd you get the idea? I, had, I was on the, the nothing side. I was on the legal side. I have a uh, law degree from Germany. Um, my focus is in intellectual property law, and I was writing a dissertation about what's the biggest problem we're going to have with technology in, in IP law. And the answer was 3D. You know, we had we went through this with the digital assets. We went through this with uh, images, not, but we kind of adjusted the market adjusted. We have iTunes, we have Netflix. Um, when it comes to 3D, the problem is that uh, no one can really pr- protect intellectual property. So we thought, okay, we can't just track a file down. We have to actually know what a file is, of what it's similar to, what, what's in it, etc. So we have to actually understand what 3D models are. And we looked at all the technology that was available, and we realized, uh, bless you, uh, we realized <laughs> we realized that uh, nothing was actually built to understand 3D from a 3D perspective. Everything was just a 2D uh, technology like point cloud or whatever, trying to understand 3D. So we actually created something that would uh, identify IP theft. And then we brought it to market 2016. We showed it to a bunch of companies and they came back saying, well, that's great and all, but my God, we could use this in engineering. We could use this in just seeing if we can manufacture something. Because it's all pattern research. recognition, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Really interesting. Okay. So how many, how many users have you scaled to today? How many folks using it? That's a great question. So uh, there are quite a few licenses out there being used. And the reason it's hard for me to put an exact number on is because we have some institutional agreements with like uh, FISNA, the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, and NASA Space Camp. Um, and, you know, in that, the, the latter case, they have um, 
you know, 300,000 people a year coming through who have access to it. So I don't know how many people are actually uh, utilizing it at any given time. In the case of Purdue, they have 1,400 people who can uh, use it at any given time, too. So it's hard to say how many are actually using it at any one time. I could look it up, but... Maybe, uh, okay, let's do a simple... I was going to say, let's do a simpler <laughs> number. How, how many organizations, not seats, but how many organizations are using the tool? Uh, that's a good question. So I would say uh, right now we're probably talking around, uh, if you add between the non-governmental uh, and the governmental and the testers versus the uh, actual customers, we're only around uh, 50. We ruled this out around- Why do you uh, say only, by the way? That's totally respectable for an enterprise kind of company. Well, I say only because we just started uh, selling it uh, about a month or two ago actively. We, we didn't have a sales force two months ago. Okay, okay, got it. <laughs> so we just added one on. So the numbers aren't as, uh, exactly where I think they'll be in a, a couple of months. In January, February, we're expecting to start to see a lot of scaling. Yeah, well, I mean, if I take 50 organizations and then you just told us a second ago, if we assume the lower side of your average of 50 seats at 2,500 bucks a month, I mean, or 2,500 bucks a year, I mean, that would put you right now, I think, at what, like a 500 grand a month run rate, something like that. Is that accurate? Well, most of those companies I included were ones that were using the, or, uh, they're using FISNA. Uh, some of them are testers like Purdue and, uh, and NASA and stuff. We'd said, okay, instead of you paying us, we wanted active feedback, you know, from these people. Tell us what are your users experiencing? What would you like to see differently? You know, let's have a lot of dialogue going on. And we decided not to charge them. So, you know. Oh, I see, I started, see. Yeah, so the paying customers, there's... Uh, or only maybe a third or under a third of that. Okay. And um, yeah, so I would say that next year, our, our goal for next year is to add on probably about, uh, I, I would think we get to uh, maybe another 100 or 200 uh, paying customers. That's great. So a third of 50, we'll call maybe 15 or something have converted from free to paid. Is that accurate? Sure. And I mean, is that the model? You kind of give them a free usage, get them addicted, and then they have to pay? <laughs> and if so, like what's the, what's creates the forcing function to move them from free to paid? Uh, we don't typically go free to paid with companies. We do that. Um, those were these were earlier uh, deals that we had signed up uh, or alliances that we had formed essentially with these companies who had unique perspective into the software. With larger companies, sometimes we'll do a trial where they'll be able to try it out for you know thirty days, maybe even sixty days or something with some users and see, make sure that it does what we say it's going to do, and it does. Um, but typically, um, you know, it's it is a pay to play thing. You, you do pay for seats. Um, but we have demos are willing to uh, let people play around with it and make sure that you know it really does have the effect that they think it will. That's great. That's great. Okay. So I mean, 15 instead of 50, that would put your, your monthly recurring somewhere closer to like 150 grand a month. Is that is that more directionally correct? Well, we're looking, it's not 2,500 a month, it's 2,500 a year um, that we charge our users. And uh, we have, um, so the, the best number for me to give you is going to be the, is, uh, the 2019 numbers uh, because th those are pretty well, I think we're pretty uh, exact with what we're going to have next year. We should be at least at about 5 million uh, recurring annual revenue um, by the end of 2019. And, and how much uh, growth these, would you have to drive to actually hit that though? What, what are you at today? Uh, we would have to go, uh, well, some of our, uh, some of that's from customers converting from non-paying to paying. Right. Totally so get that. It's kind of hard to figure that. <laughs> you know, I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking just, I like, totally get that. I'm talking, yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm Do talking have, like that, double, triple. About, uh, I mean, that's probably four X or more. Okay. Uh, we'd have now. Yeah. Got it. Well, 5 million run rate is about 400 grand a month. So, I mean, I mean, are, have you guys sure. broken a million yet in ARR or are you flirting with it? Uh, we have not broken it as far as it actually received it in the bank. I see. I see. So I a see. lot of this stuff is, uh, it takes place later. It's a little bit further out, right? Yeah. yeah you've and got so pipeline. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Makes good sense. Let's, um, let's move on to some other, some other questions here about the company. So, sure. so team, talk to me about your team. How many folks today? Where's everyone based? We have 15 people. They're all in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, they, uh, the majority of them are on the tech side. Um, we have a team of, I guess, come to be eight, um, including our CTO. Did, sorry, did you say 15, Paul? F 15. Yeah. Okay. One five, not five. Oh yeah. One okay. five, one five <laughs> in Ohio, and everyone's in Ohio. That's great. Yeah. Everyone's actually here in the office. That's, that's great. How have you capitalized the business bootstrapped or raised? We raised that's, oh. we started off kind of a semi bootstrap at the beginning where it was kind of an experiment, but then we raised a little bit. Um, then when the technology started working, we started, we raised money and we've actually raised uh, about $2 million to date. Um, all of that's been with high net worth individuals who are, um, you know, just privately invested together. How did you get connected to them? Is there just a strong kind of angel network there in Ohio? 
Uh, I wouldn't say that Ohio is necessarily any stronger or weaker than the average state. What it is is that you know you meet somebody, <laughs> they they really like it, they invest, and they talk to their friends who um, you know co-invest with them on other things, and then they talk to their friends, and it kind of nat- it grows naturally as long as your company is you know doing well and picking up traction. Um, that can happen. That's kind of what we've been going through. Also, a lot of the investors have reinvested. Yeah, that's great. Okay, good. So two million raised date, fifteen in Ohio. Um, hoping to get to five million AR by the end of next year. Somewhere a little less than a million bucks right now. At least you have vision to that. What, what did you grow at over the past twelve months? So where were you exactly a year ago? So uh, up until um, end of August this year, um, we were primarily focused on um, proving out all the different uh, software applications because we had switched from IP protection to engineering. So we had all these companies switch over, test it, test it, make sure we can integrate it. And then also we were going through uh, with some very, very large companies, some of the largest companies in aerospace, uh, et cetera, manufacturing uh, medical devices and whatnot. We were working with them on uh, you know, proving out the concept, going through one layer at a time and uh, working our way up to like the sea level in each of those companies. And so to do that, we said we were primarily focused on not adding on too many small, let's call them smaller customers at the time because our concern was uh, since we were so small, our support staff was our development staff. <laughs> and so we said, let's think long term here. So we didn't, uh, we wouldn't allow any more. We kind of cut we kind of kept the lead list quiet. We kind of said, we're not going to be trying to actively sell to too many of these people until after that happens. And then after uh, August and September, we started, we said, okay, now we can open up the channels. Now we can actually start to have the sales happen. And so we started recruiting for our sales team. So, so sorry, is that so all, we, does that all translate to, it was zero revenue per month a year ago? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, okay. it was no actual revenue. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's great. And and so landing the first 15 customers, you've talked a little bit about how you run some pilots and how it's kind of manufacturing stuff. W- w- talk me through how you got the first paying customer. What channel did you use? Direct sales. So we okay. met with typically the way that we uh, get leads is that we actually meet with people at um, events or they hear about us online. Um, you know, they read about us in the paper or something. So which and, event um, did your first customer? Where'd you meet them? That would have been out of an I, uh, an event up in Chicago, an IMTS event. Interesting. IMTS event, IMTS in Chicago. Um, and walk me through that, how that happened. Did you have a sponsor booth or how did you get the connection going? We did. So we actually paid money for it to have a booth there set up. Um, and, you know, being a new company with new technology that's not really paralleled by anything else, we, they, they weren't even sure where to put us. So they kind of put us in the wrong aisle. But that ended up working out okay, too. We, we met a lot of people. Um, we got a lot of leads out of it. And um, some people, you know, the smaller companies are really uh, a lot easier to work with. They're faster than the larger ones, right? So the large companies, you know, we've been selling to them for months and we're still going through that process. The small companies, they can kind of turn around and say, hey, let's do this. So we, so in exchange, we kind of cut them a little bit of slack and some of them who started off really early, they got a little bit of a deal, uh, I mean, pay a little bit less, but now things are starting to normalize. And are you burning capital or profitable? No, no, we're definitely burning capital. Yeah, yeah. That's what I figured considering you've raised and you're trying to drive <laughs> some growth. Um, Correct. Churn's critical in a SaaS business. Have you lost any customers? And if so, kind of what's your annual revenue churn, would you say? Uh, well, since what's so new, the you know the actual sales side of our business, we have luckily, you know, knock on wood, not lost any customers. Um, but has anyone but, downgraded? They paid a grand a month and went down to five hundred a month. Uh, not to my knowledge, no, that's not happened. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, I would say it's probably too early to look at most of that stuff. Even even CAC, yeah, right? So. You don't you don't have a good <laughs> sense of CAC this early, do you? Uh, no, I think I think it's really hard to make any. I mean, I, I could guess at a lot of things, but I don't feel yeah. like it's really helpful. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, very good, Paul. Let's wrap up uh, here with the fame. Oh wait, actually, before we wrap up, I mean, have you looked at? Has all the two million been equity? Yes. Have you looked at you know using like venture debt so that you don't have to keep taking dilution? We've looked at it. Um, you know, we've kind of. This is a great debate. We've been going back and forth on this the entire time. Of, uh, do we do it now, or do we keep on going with equity? Um, you know, uh, with the people being uh, high net worth individuals who are investing, we've kind of chosen to kind of keep it simple, and um, equity just seemed to be the simplest option. Um, just straight up common uh, stock. Well, yeah, but it's still, it's still. I mean, of course, yeah, Absolutely. I totally get that, but it's dilutive. Yeah, it definitely yeah. Is. yeah I know. <laughs> That's no, the whole give and take. I, I know. It's, it's a trade off. It, it's got, you know, there, there are pros and cons of both sides. So we, this just ended up being the way that we ended up going. Where is there, is there a point in time where you feel like it would make good sense for you to use venture debt or, or what do you not like about it? Yeah, I think what we're going to do is uh, probably look at doing that for the next round. So we've finished up everything that we would consider seed. This 
two million. And then now we're looking probably at doing a larger raise around May um, that'll be more of a Series A type raise. And for that, we are considering doing it in the debt. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, okay, for, very. For, for, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Let's wrap up with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? That's a great question. Uh, I actually would say that one of my favorite books is The Happiness Advantage. <laughs> I think it's a great book to read. Yeah. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? Uh, I. That's a good question. There are a lot of CEOs that I follow on LinkedIn. The one, I've read a lot from Bill Gates. I think he's a great person to uh, model a lot of the practices after. So I've read some stuff from him and I've been kind of trying to incorporate that into my work schedule. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building the company? It's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I would say uh, right now, my one of my favorite tools is actually Trello, uh, which is kind of funny because it's not one that we pay for. Um, it's just uh, it makes it really easy to know what everyone's up to and where things are in the process. It simplifies things a bit for me. And number four, how many hours of sleep are you getting every night? Um uh, that's, that varies quite a bit. Um, I would say I probably average around six, maybe five to six. Okay. And situation, so Paul, married, single kids? I've been dating my girlfriend for eight and a half years, so we might as well be married. We wow. Have, yeah. Not married. So no kids? No kids. No. And how old are you? I'm 29. 29. Last question. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? My 20-year-old self? Uh, that's a great question. What did I, what I wish we, he knew? Um... I guess if I knew more about how the markets were going to perform in the future and what things I should focus on more, but I really can't look back and say, I wish I had known that back then. I, I kind of feel like um, I'm kind of glad that I made all the mistakes that I made in my life because I think that's kind of what helped me get where I am right now. So I wouldn't go back and try to prevent them. Actually. Guys, FISNA launched 2015, making architects, engineers, anyone using CAD, their life simpler. Started off trying to make sure and, and trying to prevent essentially copyright uh, or fraud or, or you know IP protection, essentially. Now in a much different space, 15 enterprise customers doing about, you could call it pushing a million bucks per month or per year, sorry, in revenue up from nothing a year ago. They've just really pivoted to this space. They are burning capital. They've raised about 2 million bucks to date, 15 people in Ohio as Paul looks to scale the company. Paul, thanks for taking us to the top. Thank you. It was nice talking to you.